Remember that scene in Prometheus where the biologist Milburn decides to physically interact with the clearly menacing looking unidentified alien creature which results in... Oh, ah. You're strong? You see, after that moment, I couldn't take the movie seriously because that one dumb decision alone cost the movie its entire sense of believability. And that's excusing a scientist taking off his helmet in potentially lethal atmosphere or Medrith's inability to turn left or right. But many films are guilty of breaking their own illusion. Horror films especially fall victim to dumb decisions that conflict with human logic, such as choosing to split up or trying to fight back against an unstoppable threat. Yet, sometimes, understanding their logic involves being empathetic of their circumstances. When a character makes a decision in a narrative, that decision needs to correlate with their emotional state and the events surrounding them. As an audience, we're predominantly in a more relaxed state of mind, even if the film succeeds in invoking temporary instances of fear or tension. So it makes sense that we become more aware or critical of a character's actions. But characters running for their lives or trying to survive dangerous circumstances are in an understandably more irrational state of mind. As such, making a dumb decision is actually the correct decision given the right context. I mean, we all make rash decisions, silly mistakes, and say some really stupid things. At least I do, because that's what makes us human. Jeremy Saunier nails this concept pretty well in his appropriately self-titled Clusterfuck trilogy, comprising of Murder Party, Blue Rune, and Green Room. What's consistent about all three films is that they all have an inept protagonist driving the story. It's frustrating to see a character acting dumb, but nobody is experienced in every situation, so that stupidity actually makes the movie more believable. In the revenge thriller Blue Room, every action or decision Mac and Blair's character Dwight makes results in consequences that usually hurt him physically or psychologically. Dwight isn't so much stupid as he is just tremendously inexperienced at coping with stressful situations. The fact that he's so ordinary and innocent makes us sympathetic off him and subsequently the tragedy becomes even bleaker when you realize his own mistakes cost him everything. Saunier describes his style as rather haphazard in that intuition overshadows intellect because it makes the storytelling feel more organic and humanized as a result. And Green Room prominently reflects this unpredictable and compulsive behavior in the way that violence is portrayed in such an ugly, disorderly, abrupt fashion. In fact, the late Anton Yelchin's character Pat best summarizes the entire situation using a paintballing analogy. We were getting slaughtered by these legit Iraq vets. Tactics, hand signals, flanking, just wiped us all out. So Rick gets fed up, says, fuck it. So the last match, and he just tears out there. Full jackass, wipes out their whole team. To put that into context, we have a group of young, naive musicians fighting for their lives against an organized gang of murderous neo-Nazis. Yes, that's actually the premise. What is made absolutely clear by switching between both sides of the conflict is that the band are completely out of their element while the Nazis are in total control of the situation. The band early in the film are shown to have no plan or direction at all and are simply wandering place to place with no clear objective to speak of. And we see this in how they treat music as this spontaneous experience that exists and happens purely in the moment. They are completely detached from having structure, order, or any sense of responsibility. And they especially don't help themselves by thinking it was a good idea to play an aggressive anti-racist song in front of a crowd of aggressive racists. So when they're hit with the reality of their dire situation, they have zero idea to how to maturely respond to it. Maybe she's not dead. <laughs> On the neo-Nazi side, their leader Darcy has such an extremely meticulous protocol and code of conduct that's religiously adhered to by the Nazis, and his intelligence gets to a point of actually being kinda scary. At one point, his sudden anger is met by surprise by Clark and Gabe, followed by an apology. As simple as this moment seems, it becomes clear that Darcy discourages irrational or outright aggressive behaviour and promotes vigilance. And that's what humanizes them. They behave as professionals and make smart tactical decisions, whereas the band are driven entirely by the opposite response out of adrenaline and desperation. 
They say and do stupid things because they panic like any other rational human being. Once outside the room for the first time, for example, Tiger suggests that they split up and this is met with agreement. But it's not as literal as that. The band are just so focused on their own self-preservation and watching their surroundings that they aren't actually paying attention to each other. And that's what gets both Tiger and Reese killed almost immediately. They respond purely with compulsion because they want to survive, and their decision to leave the room in the first place is entirely summarized with fuck it. Sticking true to their in-the-moment philosophy, they just hope for the best and make it up as they go along, and that really plays a big part into why the film works because of how much it contrasts with the skinheads. In two scenarios, they try to exit only to wind up back in the green room. The second time, they manage to obtain a shotgun only to immediately lose it once they go outside. It's stupid but honest because Sonia is expressing the reality of the fight or flight response, which is driven entirely by instinct and intuition rather than any sense of logical consideration. But when Pat finally tells his paintball analogy, then the solution to their problem was actually the strategy they were using the entire time, except they apply a more thoughtful, aggressive tactic to counter their opposition. And bear in mind, at this point in the story, both Amber and Pat have been shot and mutilated, that they're both suffering from shock, adrenaline, and extreme fatigue. They're completely delirious and zoned out of any sense of care for life or death. And their plan ultimately works because their erratic behaviour catches the skinheads off guard and makes them nervous. So when they finally confront Darcy, the fear surprisingly switches to him. Pat and Amber are in control of the situation because they have nothing left to lose, and Darcy, despite his intellect and calmness throughout the entire experience, simply contradicts everything his character is, and walks off in shock, hoping for the best. And that's why I love Green Room. It's the simplicity of that very moment, the contradiction of Darcy's character, because it calls upon the contradiction of Milburn's character in Prometheus, where there is no logical justification for why he would make contact with this thing. But in Darcy's case, that contradiction makes him more human, and thus makes the film more believable as a result. And to further add to this, Watch the film again with the subtitles turned on and pay close attention to the dialogue. What Sonia does right is that he doesn't believe the audience need exposition to enjoy the film. It's more important that the characters speak and behave as they would naturally without the arbitrary need to explain information. Because everything in Green Room, as random as it may seem, actually makes sense when you start to piece together the little complexities that make it an intelligent thriller.